once you get convicted, you already have that like scar the letter F that you're a felon, you're gonna fail. And that's not what motivates people to wanna change. For most people who've been incarcerated, life doesn't go back to normal the day they walk out of jail. It's hard to live life like this, always being looked at at your worst and not really at your best. Can't really move forward. That's Philadelphia resident Latanya Myers. When she was 12, she was arrested for hitting her mom's abusive boyfriend with an air freshener can. A lawyer advised her to plead guilty so she could go home, but the conviction went on her record. She spent years in and out of the system. In 2012, she got up to five years in prison for misdemeanor charges. She was released early, but had three years of parole, followed by about a decade of probation. Parole happens when you're released from jail to serve the rest of your sentence at home, but with major conditions, like completing behavioral programs, submitting to regular drug testing, wearing an ankle monitor, or showing up for check-ins. Probation is a period of supervision that can be in addition to or instead of incarceration. For Latanya's probation, she had to go to weekly check-ins, take anger management classes, and go to mandatory drug testing. She could also be visited randomly at home or at work. And Latanya isn't alone. One in 55 adults in the U.S. are under some form of supervision. That's 4.5 million people, double the number behind bars. In Philadelphia, it's one in 23, and a disproportionate number of them are black. Pennsylvania allows some of the longest supervision terms in the country, in some cases even longer than 10 years. Proponents of probation say that it offers former offenders useful social services and uses the threat of jail to keep people motivated. But some think the opposite is true. The longer the term, the more likely people are to commit technical violations which are actions against the terms of their probation, but not necessarily against the law. This could be as simple as being unable to pay for court fees or missing a check-in because you have to go to work or don't have childcare. Such violations can extend probation terms longer or even lead to reincarceration. When Latanya missed a few probation check-ins to go to work, she was nearly rearrested. In her case, probation directly interfered with the positive steps she was taking towards rehabilitation. This is why long probation terms can make people more likely to end up back in jail, not less. And this can cause prison populations to skyrocket. In fact, an estimated one quarter of people in state prisons are not there for new convictions, but for these technical violations. So if long probation terms aren't keeping people from returning to jail, do they at least help rehabilitate or keep the public safer? Well, research has found that probationers who commit new crimes usually do so in their first year. After that, probation terms can be shortened with no increase in recidivism. That's why states like California and Wyoming have passed legislation to cap probation at two to three years. As for what less intrusive probation models could look like, we're getting a chance to experiment on a large scale right now. Many states like New York, Wisconsin, and Colorado made changes to their probation and parole systems during the COVID-19 pandemic, limiting in-person check-ins with probation officers, eliminating supervision fees, and pausing arrests of people who have technical violations. But is a less is more approach the right one? How do we draw the line between where probation helps and where it hurts? To see what happened to LaTanya and what they're doing in Philadelphia to kickstart reform, watch Philly DA, a docuseries about trying to change the justice system from the inside. Stream it on the PBS video app.